I'm now in my seventh decade and Nick allows me to come along and talk as long as I give the big picture because my knowledge of the technical stuff is a little bit out of date but the big picture stuff you know I'm, I'm the kind of village elder I'm going to give you the big story here and this is also as much entertainment as information as we go forward but I'm just going to talk for about 10 or 15 minutes on this. Um, so let's just start. Uh, it's quite common to give a declaration of uh, any conflicts of interest before you give a talk. Um, and I have to confess that I belong to a particular cult, a religious cult or quasi-religious cult called genomic fundamentalism. Here's a Wikipedia article uh, about this particular religion here. Uh, and we believe in genomic fundamentalism that uh, Lord Venter created the world on July the 28th, uh, 1995, um, which was um, the date on which the first bacterial genome sequence was published. Um, uh, but we believe he seeded his creation with misleading evidence that, they, that the world existed before then. Um, and we have this creed that there shall be one diagnostic test in genome sequencing. Um, and we look forward to this imminent arrival of the sequencing singularity. And there are various deities and saints uh, that were associated with this. Um, if you were to click on the link at the bottom about the history, there you'd see an entry about Lord Loman of Longbridge, who is clearly one of the uh, high priests of genomic fundamentalism. And uh, now I'm going to just talk a little bit about predicting the future. So uh, when I was a kid, uh, when I was growing up, um, men were walking on the moon. Uh, and it was thought at that time that perhaps uh, it would be possible to take your holidays in the future on the moon. And in fact, just in the Observer magazine last weekend, they revisited this um, and pointed out that yes, they were looking at the idea that you might be able to take a package holiday uh, on the moon uh, in, in the future. Well, that didn't happen. Um, and, uh, you know, that's disappointing. But during my uh, adult lifetime, uh, I've seen all sorts of marvellous things. I was there when the Berlin Wall came down doing my bit to knock the concrete out of that wall. Um, and we, we all saw on television Nelson Mandela uh, walk free. Uh, these were things that we didn't expect, uh, uh, but they came to pass. But let's cast our minds back uh, to the 1970s, or, or strictly speaking to 1980. Um, just as a bit of audience participation, anyone recognize this chap? Anyone want to comment on the, on the chat forum? Surely someone must recognize him. No? Okay, well, it's not me, no, it's Sanger, yeah. It, it's Fred Sanger. I, I, I'm afraid I'm nowhere near as eminent as this guy. Um, and his um, key contribution to our discipline was that he invented DNA sequencing with chain termination. First published this in 1977. Here's one of the first ever published sequencing gels uh, from that paper. Um, and uh, he went on to get his second Nobel Prize uh, for that work uh, uh, just in a few years later in 1980. Um, and would you have bet on him transforming the world with this sequencing at that time? I, I'm not sure if you would. At the time, people were much more interested in protein sequencing than they were in DNA sequencing. But as time progressed, uh, basically we, we've seen some remarkable changes over the, uh, the years and the decades. We've seen the exponential growth of computing, this idea of Moore's law, uh, where uh, we can see an exponential growth in the uh, computing power, uh, the, pr uh, the price of, of, of computer power as well, transistor price uh, falling dramatically. And we've seen a dramatic change in the cost of sequencing since the days of Sanger. Um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, at, at the order of 10 to 9, 10 to the 10, this is almost kind of astronomic figures in the, in the way in which we've seen this drop. Um, I, I think George Church has pointed this out, you know, where else in society, we, in, in any of the things we do, do we see such a dramatic change in the price? Imagine if, if, if the, the price of a McDonald's hamburger had, had, had fallen by 10 to the 10, or the, the price of, of, of a car, you know, if, it's absolutely astonishing. 
Now you might say, well, uh, there's only a certain amount of sequencing you want to do. So if it just comes cheaper, it'd just be cheaper to do it. But obviously it's not quite like that. There's a certain amount of money that wants to chase sequencing. And the more, it, the cheaper it becomes, the more sequencing we do. And so we're seeing this, uh, these are old slides as well, seeing this massive uh, exponential growth in, in sequencing uh, over the years and over the decades. Um, in fact, uh, it got even more exciting uh, one, with the invention of, of what are sometimes called next generation or high throughput sequencing approaches, where uh, sequencing started to then outperform Moore's law. Um, and, and George Church actually, uh, in, in his uh, recent book on this, he, he described the exponential increase in sequencing at that time as a sequencing pandemic because it was just a quite remarkable uh, spread of sequencing technologies and the democratization of sequencing across the world. It's worth, of course, noting that it wasn't just the sequencing, it was the bioinformatics that had to keep up with that. And to some degree, bioinformatics has kept up with it. So you can see here uh, improvements in the, in the various algorithms that are used uh, to analyze sequences uh, over the years as well. A few years ago, uh, uh, we, I, I took this particular slide here. Uh, Nick will tell you that it's, it's very commonly used in any conference uh, as a part of conference uh, bingo, where basically you, you basically collect all the cliched slides that, that, that people put up, and this is clearly one of them. But what we did was we just thought, well, okay, what if we extrapolated uh, from there and I kind of worked out that in, in, in maybe 2025, the year that I, uh, my normal retirement date, you know, sequencing, would, it would cost you a few pence to sequence uh, a bacterial genome. And, and back when we first thought about this, uh, you know, eight, 10 years ago, who was like, oh, that can't be true. And I was joking saying, well, basically this is like the idea of the sequencing singularity where sequencing becomes just so cheap that you could just do it on anything. And, and, and you think of new uses that just, wouldn't have been possible before. Um, uh, so George Church, I mentioned him before, he, he's, he's part totally bonkers and mad and part a great visionary. And his book is very interesting. It's half mad and half, uh, half a, a great vision of the future. But at the end of the um, book, there's some notes on how he's encoded his book into DNA sequences. Um, and this is a, a lively area of uh, investigation. Um, you and Bernie uh, in, in 2013 actually published a paper in Nature saying that, oh, look, you could actually uh, encode uh, any information in DNA sequences and store it, and then you could get it back out again by sequencing it. Um, uh, and more recently, the, the, there have been advances in, in, in this. And so there's a protocol now published in Nature Protocols on reading and writing digital DNA, uh, digital data into DNA. So you can take films, you can take pictures, you take the whole of Shakespeare, you can put them into DNA if you want to. One of the great uh, things that's happened in, in my working life is that uh, we, through, through sequencing, um, uh, uh, we have seen this reunification of the life sciences. So uh, those of you who know me know that early in my adult life, I developed a great uh, interest in evolution and, and Darwin's achievements. I never at those early stages believed that we would see a unification of evolution with microbiology. That they, you know, interest in evolution was seen as a sort of side angle from the job I was supposed to be doing in the working day. But uh, through, through the, the, the influence of Darwin and also this guy who's neglected, Willy Hennig, who basically told us that all our classification schemes should be phylogenetic and that phylogeny is the only thing that matters and trying to work out what the um, biological characteristics of an organism is, is irrelevant. You just draw the trees and that's your classification. And then Carl Woese came along and showed that you could start talking about bacterial evolution. Uh, I still remember the time when I saw this paper in, in June 1987 in the library and it was just wow actually there is such a thing as bacterial evolution and you can study it uh, and, and use sequences to do that. And, and you know, this really has meant that there's this unification of life sciences. So whether you're working uh, uh, as a, a microbiologist, a virologist, bacteriologist, protozoologist, or you're working as a plant scientist, or whether you're studying cancer, we're all now using the very same 
vocabulary. We're all talking about SNPs and fitness and trees and synonymous mutations and non-synonymous mutations. And so, you know, I can have a conversation with someone who's interested in, say, the evolution of wheat, and we are talking the same language now, which is a remarkable thing. And, you know, this has given rise now to this huge big picture view of, uh, of Darwin's tree of life. Uh, and we can see uh, this in all its glory now uh, with the advent of so much sequencing um, and the availability of ready bioinformatics to analyze those sequences. Now, of course, I've wandered off the topic a bit. The key point of this workshop uh, I just hope rammed home is that now we can apply evolutionary thinking, uh, tree drawing, to viruses as well. Um, and even though people say, well, they're not quite living or are they they're not quite part of the great tree of life, you can draw trees for them. Um, and you can look at uh, what this means and you can actually now feed this in to um, public policy making. So this lineage B117 here that you can see that particular clade, um, you know, I still find it exciting that people talk about clades because, you know, that's one of Hennig's ideas that wasn't anything to do with microbiology in his first book. But this clade now is, is influencing policy uh, in the UK. Now, of course, the, the key point is that sequences are not enough on their own. You need the bioinformatics to go with it. Uh, there's a brief history of bioinformatics published last year that uh, pointed out that, um, you know, DNA came late to the table, actually, the protein sequencing first. But uh, basically, the, the message is that we need bioinformatic, bioinformatics now and we need bioinformaticians. Um, and there's uh, going to be a significant increase in the workload for bioinformaticians and job opportunities for bioinformaticians as uh, time goes forward. Um, and, you know, some people would say, well, uh, hang on, why, why can't I just use some kind of user-friendly system on Windows or the Mac operating system? Why do I have to master this bloody command line? Well, the command line is here to stay. You've had to master it to do these exercises. Um, it's possible that, yeah, you can come up with nice uh, user interfaces, uh, that uh, user-friendly things. Once you have a standard operating procedure that's gonna be there for years on, uh, at a time, but if you're going to stay at the cutting edge, uh, you have to use the command line. And that is the, the, the place where bioinformaticians meet and do their work. Now, key point about doing bioinformatics, though, is that you can do it anywhere. Um, and uh, I've, I've collaborated with people in Palestine and, you know, uh, pointed out that actually you can do coding, you can do your bioinformatics uh, far removed from uh, the person that's employing you or from the context in which the, that data is going to be used. So here's an example of a project called Code for Palestine, where people working in the Gaza Strip, which is a very difficult place to get any work to actually even just to survive in, uh, people were doing have been doing bioinformatics. And I've just got a, 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 a little uh, movie I'm here from, from a young lady. Um, oh, hang on, it's not showing it for some reason. وفرص العمل يعني يعني ممكن نقول انه 50 من 50 حد ممكن اثنين او ثلاثه يشتغلوا بشكل ثابت والباقي بيشتغل بشكل مؤقت وال وجزء منهم برضه ما بيشتغل بيحاول وهي هذا من ضمن الاسباب اللي خلتني ارجع للبرمجه من ثاني انه انا اوريدي دارسه هندسه الحاسوب وكنت بفكر اني اشتغل بشيء ثاني غير مجالي فلما لقيت انه سوق العمل مش موفر باي وظيفه فرجعت ثاني للبرمجه وبتخيل ان انا بقدر اشتغل في في بيتي وبقدر الاقي وظيفه من اي مكان لو كنت انا بعرف منيح كثير اللي هو السوفت وير سكيلز ان انا عندي اللي هي ان انا قويه في مجالي ممكن اقدم على اي موقع واحصل على وظيفه بسهوله Okay, and so basically that's more or less me finished. Uh, it's now over to you. You've, you've had exposure to the, uh, the, the various bioinformatics skills and pipelines uh, that are useful for um, analyzing viral sequences and other microbial sequences. Um, but before I go, there's one last thing I'd like to do. So um, 
I, probably uh, most people aren't aware of this, but yesterday was a big day in Uganda. Uh, it was their election day. And we were banking on uh, some Ugandans taking part in this. Uh, they, they'd certainly signed up for it. I, I don't know if, if any of them actually turned up. Uh, I, I think probably not. And the reason was because they switched off the internet uh, in Uganda yesterday. Um, now, obviously, it would be totally inappropriate for me to comment on uh, the outcome of that election and to get into the politics of it. But I hope that you'll forgive me if we engage in a little bit of communication, science communication here, um, and look at Uganda as an example of how someone standing for high office uh, might want to engage with the public in understanding the problems of today. So here we go. And that's where you finished. Thank you. Mark, how easy or difficult was it to engage um, and involve all the partners and collaborators <laughs> in the Climb Data Consortium? Good question. Yeah, okay, well, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, it, it was a challenge, I, have to, uh, I say. Um, it's, uh, they say that sometimes when you're talking about getting academics to work together, it's like herding cats. Um, and, and there's certainly some of that involved in this. Um, we, we've had, to, we did have some problems with certain, uh, if individuals move from one university to another, the, it didn't work out as smoothly as we'd like. Um, I mean, for me, getting the getting the proposal signed off by the relevant, I mean, I think Nick still gets post-traumatic stress because I had to go high up in the hierarchy at Birmingham and shout at people there who blamed him for the fact that this unruly guy was giving them so much grief. But yeah, it was it was it was difficult, but um, it. It, it all came to, it's come together. We came together in the CLIMB project and then the CLIMB big data project. We are, we're still not uh, in, in a great place because we still, we're trying to integrate the quadrum and that's going to take a bit more time because the COVID has slowed things down. We do have engagement with the MRC unit in the Gambia um, and we're trying to help them develop their uh, setup there. Um, there have been discussions about whether they should become an African hub and we've been discussing with them about that saying well we're not quite sure how the internet's wired in Africa it, if someone's in Kenya or Uganda are they going to be able to access um, the Gambia quickly enough to be for it to be useful would they not be better off using uh, servers say in Europe um, um, so we're having interesting discussions um, uh, but you, in Africa, you have competitive interests. Well, yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that has been great is that we've got people from different institutions working together, not competing with each other. We've built a, a, a facility uh, which basically everyone is a winner. You know, like they, they say, a rising tide floats all boats. And basically with the client big data, um, we, we've made it available uh, from one end of our country to the other. Uh, it, universities uh, across the country uh, um, and public health agencies um, and so it has been very re rewarding it, it's certainly been very difficult at times but it's now I can sit back and and, and, and take that warm glow of achievement and obviously Nick uh, is part of this as well how did you join the paramilitary wing of genomic fundamentalism well you'll have to have a chat with Nick afterwards you know he, he's he's young and, and hot-headed you know, I, I sit in the armchair a bit too much now, but he, he's got uh, he's AK-47 and it, it'll take you there. I think the answer is by coming by coming to this workshop, you've already self-identified as yeah, uh, self -identified. a genomic fundamentalist. <laughs> yeah, you'll be, you'll be on the FBI. 